comprehend what peace is about. We're going to begin with some music. The song company were going to open with a number familiar to you called, called uh, Come On, Be Happy. <laughs> but after hearing the news sweeping around the world about the results, the possible result of the American election, we thought it was a totally inappropriate number. <laughs> and uh, we'll Stranger go east. Papa said you should really go. Our mama just sang, I will miss you so. Oh, remember me. Have you ever even talked to a stranger? Have you ever been yourself a stranger in a strange country? Human, being human, over here and over there. Human, being human, everybody Human being, human being. Human, 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 human. Meet Muhammad, Buddha, Guru. Of course, they've got a fitting answer. Think for yourself. Good and bad, they will always fight. The side that wins is always right, just like in a game. Gonna trouble the water. Wait in the water, 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 wait. 
Children It's okay, you've not heard the last of the song company. The evening will end with them reappearing. Now, at this particular time, when the prevailing political culture around the world wants us to suspend our ability to analyze and criticize, when we're all being asked to collude with the erosion of civil liberties, we need to be here in this auditorium for the next 60 minutes. We need to hear from this important citizen. Would you please welcome to the stage the Indian writer and human rights campaigner, Arundhati Roy. Let me first, on your behalf, acknowledge the Aora people, the traditional owners of this land. That acknowledgement is incredibly important in the effort to comprehend what peace with justice is about. And uh, she may not thank me for saying this, but the fact that Arundhati is giving one third each of the Peace Prize money to uh, particular groups from South Australia, a group concerned with youth unemployment, Aboriginal youth unemployment from the ACT and the Mudjingral Women's Education Group from here in Redfern is of enormous significance. (laughs) 
I also want to thank the uh, partners in peace because the Sydney Peace Foundation is an important alliance of corporate, media, community sector and academic interests. We desperately need to trespass into areas of communication and association and solidarity, particularly about human rights and a common humanity that we don't usually trespass into. So in that respect, I'm pleased to acknowledge the important uh, support of the City of Sydney, of Gilbert and Tobin and of PBL Limited. And it's no accident that this is known as the City of Sydney Peace Prize Lecture. Now, there are a couple of assumptions that I have to correct that uh, probably a lot of you are holding in your heads. One is that some people seem to think that the, the Peace Prize is going to be awarded this evening. It's not. It's traditionally awarded at a ceremony after the lecture. So I hope you'll not be too disappointed about that. The other assumption is that the prize is awarded depending on the performance of the lecture. Um, <laughs> and I'm, I'm just here to reassure Aaron Darty, that's not true either. <laughs> Let me, by way of introduction, just mention the names uh, of the previous recipients of the Sydney Peace Prize and the topics of their, of the titles of their lectures, because that gives us a flavour of what peace with justice is about. Its complexity, its diversity, its enormous necessity for people, particularly for vulnerable people, but for all of us. The first Peace Prize was awarded to Mohammed Yunus, the wonderful founder of the Grameen Bank for the Poor, which, at my last check, still loans most of its money to 98% uh, of women recipients. And uh, Professor Yunus's title of the Peace Prize lecture that year was Peace is Freedom from Poverty. And he was followed a year later by that giant of the 20th century, Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu, who came to Sydney to tell us to say, how to say sorry. He had come fresh from chairing the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. His title was Peace Through Reconciliation. And there followed a year later a man who was a painter and a poet before he became a guerrilla leader and then stays as a painter and a poet and in my judgment that's why he's such a good politician, the leader of the newest country in the world, President Janana Guzman. And after Janana came somebody whom I think we still dearly miss in public life in this country. Sir William Dean, whose commitment to the cause of Aboriginal reconcilia reconciliation and whose commitment to comprehending what the quality of life of the most vulnerable of Aboriginal people uh, was like, was, was remembered right across the nation during the period of his uh, impressive governor generalship. And after Sir William Dean, we at last, I think, acknowledged a woman who in the Western world was probably the one of the most significant movers and shakers about human rights since Eleanor Roosevelt, who you remember, was one of the architects of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And that year we acknowledged on this platform Mary Robinson, the former president of Ireland, the former, at that time she just finished her, her role as Commissioner for Human Rights. And Mary's address was peace through human rights. And then last year, who can, is anybody here who can forget last year? <laughs> last year was a lesson really for everybody, if only they'd listen, that uh, negotiations about peace are not about level playing fields. They're not about 50% balance. They're about positive discrimination in favour or to uh, hear the point of view of the most powerless. And we wanted to accord dignity to a significant Palestinian, and I think we did that, and Hannah Nashrawi gave one of the most profound lectures I've heard about uh, peace in the Middle East and humanitarian imperative. And then this year, the deliberations of the jury were concerned with uh, basically three criteria rolled into one. The concern with advocacy of human rights, the concern with understanding and advocacy of the philosophy and language of nonviolence, and then that beautiful phenomenon, uh, the concern for a common humanity. And Arundhati Roy's work in the Namada Dam project concerned with compensation 
for the millions of people displaced, her concern for the victims of communal riots, her concern for the dignity of women in India, her trenchant opposition to the absurdity of nuclear arms made no doubt in the minds of the jury that we should award the 2004 Sydney Peace Prize to Arundhati Roy. Please welcome her to the platform. So I don't know whether I'm nervous of you or of the fact that Bush is winning the elections or of what I'm about to say, but my uh, talk is called Peace and the New Corporate Liberation Theology. So it's official now, the Sydney Peace Foundation is neck deep in the business of gambling and calculated risk. Last year, very courageously chose Dr. Hanan Ashravi of Palestine for the Sydney Peace Prize. And as if that were not enough, this year, of all the people in the world, it goes and chooses me. However, I'd like to make a complaint. My sources inform me that Dr. Ashrawi had a picket all to herself. <laughs> this is discriminatory, and I demand equal treatment for all peace prizes. So may I formally request the foundation to organize a picket against me after the lecture. <laughs> From what I've heard, it shouldn't be hard to organize. And if this, is, this isn't sufficient notice, then tomorrow will suit me just as well. <clears throat> When, when this year's Sydney Peace Prize was announced, I was subjected to some pretty arch remarks from those who know me well. Why did they give it to the biggest troublemaker we know? Didn't anybody tell them that you don't have a peaceful bone in your body? And memorably, Arundhati Didi, what's the Sydney Peace Prize? Was there a war in Sydney that you helped to stop? <laughs> but speaking for myself, I'm utterly delighted to receive the Sydney Peace Prize, but I must accept it as a literary prize that honors a writer for her writing. Because contrary to the very many virtues that are falsely attributed to me, I'm not an activist, nor the leader of any mass movement, and certainly not the voice of the voiceless. We know, of course, that there is really no such thing as the voiceless. There are only the deliberately silenced and the preferably unheard. I'm a writer and I cannot claim to represent anybody but myself. So even though I would like to, it would be presumptuous of me to say that I accept this prize on behalf of those who are involved in the struggle of the powerless and the disenfranchised against the powerful. However, may I say I accept it as the Sydney Peace Foundation's expression of solidarity with a kind of politics, a kind of worldview that millions of us around the world subscribe to. Thank you. It might seem ironic that a person who spends most of her time thinking of strategies of resistance and plotting to disrupt the putative peace is given a peace prize. You must remember that I come from an essentially feudal country, and there are few things more disquieting than a feudal peace. Sometimes there's truth in old cliches. There can be no real peace without justice, and without resistance, there will be no justice. Today, it is not merely justice itself, but the idea of justice that is under attack. The assault on vulnerable, fragile sections of society is at once so complete, so cruel, and so clever, all-encompassing and yet specifically targeted, blatantly brutal and yet unbelievably insidious, that its sheer audacity has eroded our definition of justice. It has forced us to lower our sights and curtail our expectations. Even among the well-intentioned, the expansive, magnificent concept of justice is gradually being substituted 
with the reduced, far more fragile discourse of human rights. If you think about it, this is an alarming shift of paradigm. The difference is that notions of equality, of parity, have been pried loose and eased out of the equation. It's a process of attrition. Almost unconsciously, we begin to think of justice for the rich and human rights for the poor. Justice for the corporate world, human rights for its victims. Justice for Americans, human rights for Afghans and Iraqis. Justice for the Indian upper castes, human rights for the Dalits and Adivasis. That's the indigenous people and untouchables, if that. Justice for white Australians, human rights for aboriginals and immigrants, most times not even that. It's becoming more than clear that violating human rights is an inherent and necessary part of the process of implementing a coercive and unjust political and economic structure on the world. Without the violation of human rights on an enormous scale, the neoliberal project would remain in the dreamy realm of policy. But increasingly, human rights violations are being portrayed as the unfortunate, almost accidental fallout of an otherwise acceptable political and economic system. As though they're a small problem that can be mopped up with a little extra attention from some NGOs. This is why in areas of heightened conflict, in Kashmir and in Iraq, for example, human rights professionals are beginning to be regarded with a degree of suspicion. Many resistance movements in poor countries which are fighting huge injustice and questioning the underlying principles of what constitutes liberation and what constitutes development view human rights NGOs as modern day missionaries who've come to take the ugly edge of imperialism to diffuse political anger and to maintain the status quo. It has been only a few weeks since a majority of Australians voted to re-elect Prime Minister John Howard, who among other things led Australia to participate in the illegal invasion and occupation of Iraq. The invasion of Iraq will surely go down in history as one of the most cowardly wars ever fought. It was a war in which a band of rich nations, armed with enough nuclear weapons to destroy the world several times over, rounded on a poor nation, falsely accused it of having nuclear weapons, used the United Nations to force it to disarm, and then invaded it, occupied it, and are now in the process of selling it. I speak of Iraq not because everybody is talking about it, sadly at the cost of leaving other horrors in other places to unfurl in the dark, but because it is a sign of things to come. Iraq marks the beginning of a new cycle. It offers us an opportunity to watch the corporate military cabal that has come to be known as empire at work. In Iraq, in the new Iraq, the gloves are off. As the battle to control the world's resources intensifies, economic colonialism through formal military aggression is staging a comeback. Iraq is the logical culmination of the process of corporate globalization in which neo-colonialism and neoliberalism have fused. If we can find it in ourselves to peep behind the curtain of blood, we would glimpse the pitiless transactions taking place backstage. But first, briefly, the stage itself. In 1991, US President George Bush Sr. mounted Operation Desert Storm. Tens of thousands of Iraqis were killed in the war. Iraq's fields were bombed with more than 300 tons of depleted uranium, causing a fourfold increase in cancer among children. For more than 13 years, 24 million Iraqi people have lived in a war zone and been denied food and medicine and clean water. In the frenzy around the US elections, let's remember that the levels of cruelty did not fluctuate whether the Democrats or the Republicans were in the White House. Half a million Iraqi children died because of the regime of economic sanctions in the run-up to Operation Shock and Awe. 
Until recently, while there, was no, while there was a careful record of how many US soldiers had lost their lives, we had no idea of how many Iraqis had been killed. US General Tommy Frank said, we don't do body counts, meaning Iraqi body counts. He could have added, we don't do the Geneva Convention either. A new detailed fa study fast-tracked by the Lancet Medical Journal and extensively peer-reviewed estimates that 100,000 Iraqis have lost their lives since the 2003 invasion. That's 100 halls full of people like this one. That's 100 halls full of friends, parents, siblings, colleagues, lovers like you. The difference is that there aren't many children here today, but let's not forget Iraq's children. Technically, that bloodbath is called precision bombing. In ordinary language, it's called butchering. Most of this is common knowledge now. Those who support the invasion and vote for the invaders cannot take refuge in ignorance. They must truly believe that this epic brutality is right and just or at the very least acceptable because it's in their interest. And so the civilized modern world, built painstakingly on a legacy of genocide, slavery, and colonialism, now controls most of the world's oil, and most of the world's weapons, most of the world's money, and most of the world's media. The embedded corporate media in which the doctrine of free speech has been substituted by the doctrine of free if you agree speech. The UN's chief weapons inspector, Hans Blick, said he found no evidence of nuclear weapons in Iraq. Every scrap of evidence produced by the US and British governments was found to be false, whether it was reports of Saddam Hussein buying uranium from Niger or the report produced by British intelligence, which was discovered to have been plagiarized from an old student dissertation. And yet, in the prelude to the war, day after day, the most respectable newspapers and TV channels in the US headlined the evidence of Iraq's arsenal of weapons of nuclear war. It now turns out that the source of the manufactured evidence of Iraq's weapons was Ahmed Chalabi, who, like General Suharto of Indonesia, General Pinochet of Chile, the Shah of Iran, the Taliban, and of course, Saddam Hussein himself, was bankrolled with millions of dollars from the good old CIA. And so a country was bombed into oblivion. It's true there have been some murmurs of apology. Sorry about that, folks. But we really have to move on. Fresh rumors are coming in about nuclear weapons in Iran and Syria. And guess who's reporting on these fresh rumors? The same reporters who ran the bogus scoops on Iraq, the seriously embedded A-team. The head of Britain's BBC had to step down, and one man committed suicide because a BBC reporter accused the Blair administration of sexing up intelligence reports about Iraq's WMD program. But the head of Britain retains his job, even though his government did much more than sex up intelligence reports. It is responsible for the illegal invasion of a country and the mass murder of its people. Visitors to Australia, like myself, are expected to answer the following question when they fill in the visa form. Have you ever committed or been involved in the commission of war crimes or crimes